Welcome to the spring workshop of the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement. I'm Ray Baxter, and I am one of the two co-chairs of the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement, housed within the Health and Medicine Division of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I serve as a vice chair of the trustees of the Blue Shield of California Foundation and the secretary of the board of the CDC Foundation. I welcome our virtual audience today and those of you who will be joint watching the recorded webcast of this workshop entitled A Population Health Workshop to Meet 21st Century Challenges and Opportunities. This is a topic especially close to my heart, having served in public health for many years in New York City and San Francisco. Although this will be a virtual workshop, it is being hosted from a physical location in Washington, DC, the home of the National Academies and the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement. For that reason, I would like to, on the Acad Academy's behalf, acknowledge and offer our deep gratitude and respect to the Nakuchtank Piscataway people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. Everywhere in the United States where our speakers and attendees find themselves at this moment, they are on the lands of Native American tribes and peoples. We lift up all of the ancestors who have struggled for justice. In their memory, we seek to help build a just future by centering health equity as the prerequisite to improving population health. Today is a particularly somber day because we must acknowledge the death and suffering of innocent people in Ukraine. A terrible reminder that there can be no health without peace and justice. Our roundtable recognizes that health and quality of life for all are shaped by interdependent historical and contemporary social, political, economic, environmental, genetic, behavioral, and healthcare factors. Therefore, the Roundtable seeks to provoke and catalyze urgently needed multi-sector collaboration. Uh, that is the way, that collaborative action is the key to success. One way we aim to do this is by hosting several public workshops each year that bring together different perspectives and disciplines and sectors to explore and share what works to improve the conditions for equitable health and well being in US communities. A few words about the context for this workshop. The National Academies has produced a number of reports on public health and the public health workforce. These are included in the meeting materials. In 2019, our roundtable held a workshop on the population health workshop. Force. Speakers discussed how to support a population health orientation among public health and healthcare leaders and workers, how to frame within the context of population health the work of personnel such as community health workers, health navigators, and peer to peer educators, and leveraging the competencies of both public and private sector workforces that are working to include. So, uh, as health in all policies, such as education, transportation, and planning. The publication based on that event is also included in the meeting materials for today. Today's workshop is intended to build on those 2019 conversations with more recent insights gained from the field's response to the ongoing pandemic, including the unprecedented politicization even demonization of public health workers, and in the context of renewed policymaker attention and public expenditures directed to the workforce. Today's workshop was organized by a planning committee, which I had the privilege to chair. It was an exceptional group, including Monica Valdez Lupi, Jewel Mullen, Kara Odom Walker, and Valerie Yeager. We were especially grateful for additional help from two of our long-term roundtable colleagues, Phyllis Meadows and Jose Montero. The planning committee was supported by our outstanding roundtable staff, Alina Bashu, Asia Coltrane, Ali Andrada, and Maggie Anderson. During today's event, the planning committee attended 
to showcase the variation in training roles and settings among workers and population health, broadly defined as all those who work to promote and protect the public's health across various sectors and domains. The historical context and legal frameworks that have shaped that workforce, the current state of the workforce, challenges and opportunities, equity and representation, and the competencies, training and career pathways, along with the perspectives of educators and the next generation of workers and leaders in the field. As you will see, much is known and much is still not known or well understood. If you are tweeting today, you may refer to the speaker handles provided in the meeting materials and follow the conversation by using the hashtag PopHealthRT. Thank you for joining what I am sure will be a rich conversation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Lauren Smith, the Chief Health Equity and Strategy Officer for the CDC Foundation, who will moderate session one. Lauren. Thank you so much, Ray, for that introduction and, and for your, your words. And I especially appreciate you calling attention to and recognizing um, what's happening in Ukraine, because I'm sure that that is heavy on many of our, our minds indeed. It is my pleasure to be able to participate with this terrific panel and to have the opportunity to contribute to this very timely conversation. I think it's, I, I think it's fair to say that it is not hyperbole to, to remark that we're in a crucible moment in public health. The question is, how are we going to emerge from this trial as something new and better and even more successful? We are currently facing multiple intertwined crises in our public health workforce. The first is burnout and fatigue from two years of confronting a pandemic that has overtaken so many of the other, other uh, priorities and issues that public health has had to deal with. There's weariness and frustration from lack of trust and support to downright open hostility, which has led many of our public health practitioners and leaders to leave their jobs. And finally, there's a potential mismatch between the experience and skills that our public health workforce has and the tasks and responsibilities that are needed to overcome both new and persistent challenges, like dealing with insidious and seemingly um, <clears throat> expanding mis- and disinformation about uh, many things related to public health, especially um, vaccinations and the pandemic all the way to meaningfully engaging in productive partnerships with the public, even as mistrust of public health science and officials is so high. But our panel today will be sharing their perspectives on past, present, and future of the public health workforce, and will include actionable steps that we can take moving forward. This is not a doom and gloom session, but one where we can confront our situation with clarity and a sense of purpose, and steely resolve. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our three panelists um, all together, and then I'll invite the first panelist to, to jump in and, and kick us off. So our first, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce our first panelist, who's Merlin Takwanayum, who is the Donald G. Jemson Assistant Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. We will be listening to Shaniqua Wosu, who is the Chief Strategy Officer, and Becky Johnson, who is the Managing Director at Change Lab Solutions. Then we will be moving to Kyle Bernstein, who is the Chief of the Population Health Workforce Branch in the Division of Scientific Education and Workforce Development at the CDC. And then finally, we'll be wrapping up with Josh Sharfstein, who's the Professor of Practice in Health Policy and Management and Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Merlin. Thank you, uh, Lauren, uh, for that uh, very helpful and uh, uh, introduction. Um, I'm a little scared that uh, my screen share is not working. Um, can, can somebody... see 
we can see the first slide. Oh, terrific. Okay. Yeah, okay. you know, I can see myself, but I don't see. Uh, yes, I can see, your see first slide. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Um, Lauren Echo or Lauren raised something that uh, I was thinking about um, at the start of, of this session, um, and it's that it's a very turbulent and unsettling time. But one thing I've appreciated about this roundtable over the many years of its existence is that the people who convene here and who decide who is going to convene here, they don't just document the world's problems, but they think actively uh, on how to solve them. And so uh, I've always been inspired by uh, the work of this meeting and I'm happy uh, to be here. Uh, my task is straightforward. It's to do an overview of the history of public health. And I can't do all of that, but what I can do is derive some reigning themes in that history that I think will be useful to this conversation on population health workforce. And so let me get started with a subtitle right here the existential and the definitional, no, or what is this phrase, public health anyway? Now, the boundaries of public health, I think much more so than a lot of professions, have actually been negotiated and fought over for the 200 years or so that the modern version of public health has existed. That is, what goes inside this circle here and what goes out of it remains a source of debate. I'll give you a recent example of that. Uh, just recently, many of you know that, uh, that there, there are proponents in the profession who want to cast, characterize racism as a public health issue. And in response to this, some people bristle. Their notion of public health is one that remains inside a certain traditional conception of the term, squarely inside the circle. And there are others, though, who say, no, we have to start imagining and thinking about what's beyond that traditional circle. Now, this is, in fact, an enduring tension. And I want to use two episodes from the early founding days of modern public health institutions uh, to illustrate it. So for episode one, I want to take you back to 1839 in England, a place of immense inequality. Now, poor people during this time were sent to poor houses, poor houses, if they wanted minimal sustenance. And they had to work in these poor houses to get that minimal sustenance. And these were pretty, pretty miserable places, and many in them got very sick and even died in elevated numbers. And so some physicians were asked to tabulate statistically what the causes of death were. And one of these folks was a fellow by the name of William Farr. And he did this for about 150,000 deaths in the poorhouse. And there were numerous causes of death he put down. It was pretty rote and straightforward stuff for the most part, except for 63 of those deaths. He wrote something else. It wasn't kind of typical disease categories that he was marking as the cause of death. It was something else. And that something else was starvation, starvation. Now, Farr is not some radical, but he said through this entry for cause of death that the working conditions, specifically the poor diet that the people in the poor houses were being fed, that they were causing bodies to break. Well, this classification did not please the authorities, including one of the people who played a role in creating the laws that gave rise to expanding this poor house system. And one of those people was a person by the name of Edwin Chadwick. Now, Chadwick is a guy many of you have heard of. He is often credited, rightly, with pushing for infrastructure and mass sewage and methods for cleaning water, detecting dirty water for garbage pickup. Later, he'd become the head of England's newly created General Board of Public Health in 1848. But he was not happy with what Farr had to say. And his reaction to Farr raises the question posed by the circle. What should public health encompass? You'll recall, Farr went up to Chadwick and he recorded 63 deaths as starvation. And Chadwick resisted. And he pushed far to record either one of the more traditional disease categories or just to put it as uncertain 
or unknown. Chadwick was essentially restricting analysis of death in a poorhouse to only a very narrow set of direct causes. Now, the episode is fascinating because it raises the question, again, of how social is public health allowed to be? How much do you want to pull back and look at things like how much food people are eating and how safe the places they're working at are? How much do you want to allow people to ask those questions? When William Farr tried to do that with this starvation, uh, with this starvation analysis, Chadwick's response was simple, don't touch that. Now Chadwick himself is important too, in large part because of a famous report uh, that you see up here, it was published in 1842. This is often considered a founding document of the sanitarian school of public health, sanitarianism. It's basically the idea that we should get rid of filth and waste as much as possible. And so a lot of the infrastructure for that was put into place by people who had read Chadwick's report. But if you read the report closely, you can actually see that often he single-mindedly focused on sanitary infrastructure and getting rid of health. These are not bad things to do, of course, or the supposedly vice-ridden behavior of poor people, but he sidelines analysis of larger social structure. And so if you look at this, and remember this argument with William Farr over starvation as a cause of death, you really see that Chadwick is presenting a circumscribed vision of public health when it comes to the question of how social public health was going to be. Was going to be. Poverty, starvation, larger social conditions, largely off the table, sanitary infrastructure, garbage pickup, getting rid of filth, that's what public health was going to be about. I want to close with a second quick episode, and that's uh, around Robert Koch. Now, like Chadwick, Koch is upheld rightly as one of the most important figures in public health, but I want to reflect a bit on, his, on the legacy of his catalyzing what we now call germ theory or the bacteriological revolution. Now, for most of the 19th century, before 1882, the language of pathogens, viruses, bacteria that we take for granted today was actually very highly speculative and theoretical. People had other ways of understanding disease transmission, and it usually went something like this. Stay away from stuff that smells bad, or if you were a sanitarian, get away uh, from the filth and the dirt. Now, Koch's discovery had the potential to change that. He was researching TB, and he identified the tubercle bacillus pictured here. Oh, I lost my picture of bacillus. Well, just imagine a little germy bacillus. And he argued that there was this one-to-one -one association with having the disease and having this bacillus in your body. And it led to a view of public health where the ultimate goal was to find these viruses, these bacteria, or in our time, specific genes and develop therapeutics, medicines, antivirals, antibiotics, vaccines, to blast them away. It's what scholars call magic bullets. And it leads to a profound and still ongoing conundrum. And it runs parallel to this one. Put simply, the conundrum is this. How reductionist or holistic should public health be? It's not an either or, I think it's a continuum and I visualized it here, but it asks, is public health ultimately about chasing down a finite, narrow, sometimes singular number of causes of disease? Or is it about doing what FAR kind of flirted with, peering at things beyond just the germ or just the gene or just the immediate cause of death? This is a question I think all of us are still struggling with today, and I suspect many of us have thought about it, especially uh, in how we think about COVID. Uh, it's not an easy question at all. I think the reductionist side has a simplicity and efficiency going for it. And given that a vaccine is the reason many of us are able to do at least some of the things we did pre-COVID, maybe it's the right one. I've always viewed the term population health as opposed to public health as a way of getting at this question because one of the precepts of the field of population health is that public health 
too often constricts itself to a finite list of functions and we have to go beyond that. And for this very, for this very workshop, it raises the question of who is in the public, in the population health, not public health, population health workforce. This tension has been a difficult one for me, and I'll end uh, just a second, has been a difficult one for me because I am actually more of a techno-optimist, I would say, than some of my colleagues. And I do think among historians like myself, there is sometimes a tendency to not admit that a technological advancement indeed represents a significant rupture from the past, whether you're talking about mass communications or public health. And there are others though who worry that technology basically leads us to reductionist approaches that marginalize other important dimensions that we should be focusing on. I wrote an article a couple of years ago with two colleagues who are a lot more skeptical of technology than I am. And we criticized the term precision public health and precision more generally as too focused on individual precise magic bullets and not the holistic social structure that impacts health. And I agreed with them on that point. But I think there's no question that rapid genome sequencing, surveillance of viral spread and variants, drug development, markedly have changed in the past 20 years. And this is to say nothing of advances in computational horsepower and the amount of data one can generate and analyze. And so I'd like to think there's a way all of us can harmonize rather than hold intention technological advancement with some kind of holistic perspective on the many influences that determine health. But I think we're still figuring out what that looks like. With that, I'll close and I'm looking forward to hearing what my co-panelists have to say. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. What a provocative way to start with these questions about what's inside and outside the circle and I, that, that uh, spectrum that you share between reductionist and holistic um, tension. I think that there's a lot there that we're going to sort of uh, pull apart in our next conversations and come back. And I wanna come back to that because I have a bunch of questions.